Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musical storytellers. Kenny Holmes and Robert Kraft checking in. Yes, checking in before we check out. For another week and uh, exciting week. Another guest that is uh, coming to us from overseas. Such an interesting guest from Iceland to Berlin to the score studios that's right uh, our guest this week is hilder gudnadotter which, oh you've been practicing okay i have to say t- this this interview was taped because she had to come into town um she was doing some spotting sessions for joker and that's right when i first saw her name written i'm not familiar with the icelandic letter system and i thought the d was an o it's a funky looking. But D. anyway, if you look at it, a lowercase, the the D, it looks like an O with a line over it. So when I was pronouncing her name, I thought it was Guona Doder or daughter. And um, so anyway, in the interview, I'm totally butchering it. And um, Robert will just take the reins on saying the name. But it's Gudna Doter. And um, we're really excited to have her on the show this week. She, of course, like I said, is scoring Joker. She also is scoring the incredible new miniseries on HBO, Chernobyl, which uh, the third episode is out already, and um, it's it's off off to a, a big start. I mean, this show is going to be making waves in the award season, I think, because um, the acting is superb. The effects. I mean, it's it's a little graphic, but um, it's telling a, a very real story, and um, they don't hold back on some of the visuals with mm. that. Um, so we're going to get to our interview with Hilder coming up in just a bit, um, but we have a lot to talk about, Lots including there's uh, the, the announcement came out just late last week that Back to the Future, the musical, is being put together. Uh, it's going to be premiering in the UK in mm. February of 2020, and all the people are on board. Zemeckis... Uh, Alan Silvestri's doing the the score with um, Glenn Ballard. Glenn He's Ballard, a, you yep. know, amazing producer and songwriter. So the, I, I guess the big question is: Does Alan Silvestri get an Oscar or a Tony first? He might end up with an EGOT. You know what the EGOT is? It's I do. Emmy, Oscar. Golden Globe, Oscar. No, not Tony. Golden Globe. It's Grammy. As I was saying, it's an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and a tomato. That's the e- EGOT, which is <laughs> including the Golden Globe. You're there. right. Wow. But, who was the last person to get that? John Legend, I think. I think you're right. Yeah. I'll go with John Legend. Why yeah. not? That's an incredible feat. But Alan Sylvester doesn't have an Oscar yet, so if, if he doesn't get uh, Avengers Endgame love, then uh, maybe he gets a Tony before an Oscar, which that would be crazy. But cool. um, a chance for him uh, to get that, and that looks... It looks pretty cool. I mean, it's in the early stages, but um, if you're a fan of the, the movie, it's also going to include the classic you know pop songs like... Uh, Power of Love from Huey Lewis and the News and Johnny Be Good. So they're going to be intertwining a bunch of those songs from the movies uh, along with the original score. From Could be Alan fun. Silvestri. Uh, in other music movie news, or I guess TV music news, uh, Ramin Javadi is at number two on the iTunes chart for the Game of Thrones season eight. So another score making major waves on the pop charts. Yeah, and is- I think that a career move for him i mean of course he'd done westworld and game of thrones and incredible work but i think doing the score podcast last year that was major was kind of pivotal in his career and so check out Ramin's, check out (laughs) ramin's music and of course if you can get a chance to go to one of those live shows yeah that'll be amazing we talked about that last week yep um there was a big uh couple of award shows last week in the industry. These are the uh, BMI and ASCAP both held their awards ceremonies. Yep. Um, for those that don't know what these organizations do or are, can you briefly explain what the point of a BMI or ASCAP um, is for an artist to be a part of? And why there's two, they seem to be competing. They did their award shows on the same night, so you can't go to both. Um, so it's kind of like, can you explain that a little bit? They do compete. Um, it, I know that ASCAP was the first. It started in, I believe, 1909. This is digging way deep in my hard drive. Um, it's the American Society of Authors, Composers, and Publishers. And uh, they collect for composers when your music is played in other 
venues beside the original place. In other words, you score a film, you get paid. But I think the story is that some composers started to hear their music played in vaudeville halls in New York City and said, wait, we should get paid for this. So ASCAP and Broadcast Music Inc., that's BMI, were started to register songwriters, register music publishers, and make sure that they get paid. As a result, they are huge communities of incredible musicians and songwriters and composers and publishers. And every year they have two dinners back to back, kind of legendary dinners. The first night is always the pop awards dinner where they award the biggest songwriter of the year and the biggest song of the year. And the second night is the composer's dinner. And so certainly uh, this year was big for both of them. I know that uh, there were some big awards this year there was the bmi icon award which went to terence blanchard Mm -hmm. hugely influential deserving composer did a lot of spike lee films black klansman he's an oscar nominated he's just an incredible composer and uh a number of awards were given out there was an honorary academy award given to ready boom doom 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 boom doom Boom, doom, doom. Doo, doo, doo. That's it. Hey, Thank you. that's a duet. Lalo Schifrin got one. And uh, I know that Ludwig Goranson got one for Black Panther. And the song Shallow from A Star Is Born was also honored. Uh, ASCAP was um, acknowledging Pinar Toprak with the Shirley Walker Award. Yep, Shirley Walker. Which so is a, that's, a big, that's a big award. Big, big acknowledgement. They're great dinners um, and ceremonies. And it's a real affirmation of the music and of certainly of the film music communities. I was going to say, you, when you see, like, if you follow a lot of these composers on social media, this is one of those rare nights where they're all together. Because normally they're all locked away in their studios. And, you know, it's it's a rare occasion for all of these artists to be in one place. And, to you know, I'm, I'm sure they're not breaking down the motif they wrote for whatever score. They probably just want to have a drink and relax. And yeah. Have a good time, but it's it's cool. It's like a who's who event to to have everyone in one place like that. And I th- I don't know if it was purposeful that they were on the same night. I don't. I think it was. My sense is that that was just a an accident of timing because they are collegial. I mean, as much as it's competitive, this is all our great composers. Right. We're starting to roll towards, of course, the summer season. Forty percent of all box office is generated during the summer. And so these movies, you, you can see the tonnage is starting. And the, I'm sorry, I'm going to finish that sentence. The tonnage is coming in. It really started with Avengers, which was kind of how summer has now moved into May. Which Avengers got knocked off. John Wick takes the number one spot. Keanu Reeves, still, Finally. still a movie star. But uh, a lot of big ones coming up. Of course, the biggest coming up this weekend is going to be Aladdin. And it's going to knock off John Wick. I believe it will, because that's called an all-audience movie. Of course, you have parents, you have children. And um, I had the privilege and the pleasure of seeing The Little Mermaid live at the Hollywood Bowl on Friday night. Mm. And uh, Alan Menken was there, and he encouraged the 18,000 people in the sold-out Hollywood Bowl to come to Aladdin. He said it's very good. It will be very interesting, because... Alan is writing with Pasek and Paul. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, Little Mermaid was with the legendary and brilliant Howard Ashman, who rest in peace. Uh, Pasek and Paul, fabulous songwriters who are now known for La La Land. They won the Academy Award. Dear Evan Hansen on Broadway. Greatest showman. Yep. So they are writing the lyrics to Aladdin, uh, starring Will Smith, and that'll be, a, that'll be a big one. There are a couple other interesting ones coming out. Hmm. Um, Booksmart is getting a lot of attention. It's a little film directed by Olivia Wilde, the actress, but it's gotten an awful lot of attention because I think it's a kind of different take on the high school movie. Um, so that'll be interesting to see. And then there's a documentary that's releasing in a few theaters that I cannot wait to see called Echo in the Canyon. Oh, yeah. I think it did. I forget which film festivals, but maybe um, Sundance. I heard some buzz about this movie and uh, Jacob it's winning Dylan. all the music awards yep. for sure. Jacob, who's Bob's son, is one of the producers. Uh, it's the story of the legendary neighborhood Echo Canyon is the name of Laurel Canyon, of course, Mm -hmm. and um, I can't wait to see it because it's just for music fans and for certainly 
L.A. music fans. That, that's going to be an interesting show. Is this? It, it might be one of the last times Tom Petty was on I think it's his camera last interview. interview. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's that sounds like it'll be a musty, and I'm sure once it, you know it'll probably do a limited theatrical run, and then it'll be everywhere, and probably be up on the music movie charts of every you know every streaming service. Yeah, because that absolutely. If you're a fan of music, it's something you'll probably want to see. Um, I want to make a quick mention, too, that out today is the series finale of Blockbuster, Matt oh, Schrader's it's so exciting. Uh, Spielberg and Lucas biopod, biopic um, podcast. That, Immersive audio biopod. Yeah, and it's incredible. It's in uh, Forbes this week. Great um, press. Yeah, some really good press. Really and, deserving. Um, if you listen to episode five, that was I, I was quoted in an article saying that that was my favorite part of the series because of the, just the magic of them hearing John Williams score for star Wars the first time. And the way, uh, Peter, the sound designer put that together. It, it's, I don't even know how to explain it. I don't know how to describe it. it. I listened to it three different times on different speakers and it just sucks you in. It feel you feel like you're there. You can visualize everything. It's just, it's so well put together. And um, if you're a film fan, a Lucas fan, a Spielberg fan, or if you just like a good or story. Or a John Williams fan. Yeah, John Williams, of course. Um, it's it's really cool. And the, the podcast is wrapping up with uh, the finale that's out today. So it's bingeable. The episodes are only like 20 to 25 minutes long. So you can, you can breeze right through it on a drive home from work or something. And don't you have... A cameo. I'm 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 about five characters in there. Uh, everything from uh, Sylvester Stallone, and uh, I'm a <laughs> doctor. Bad. My big role is the doctor. I I have the most lines as the doctor. That's so. really you know that was critical. Yeah, I mean it really was. You saved saved a life. I saved George Lucas. <laughs> um, so definitely go check out Blockbuster and let us know what you think. Um, you can follow their social media's uh, Blockbuster Pod, and um, there's a lot of cool behind the scenes stuff. And uh, let us know. Let Matt Trader know what you think of Mash the podcast. Raider. That's right. Um, anything else to get to, Robert, before we take a quick break? I think it's just fun to think that we're launching into summer. We have some great guests coming up. And, of course, in the studio, we're going to talk to Hilda Goodna, daughter. Oh, now you butchered it. Hil- Hil- Hilder. Well, I was going to I like to call her Hilda. You know, we're <laughs> buddies. I call her Hilly. But um, <laughs> she's going to come in and... Boy, is she an interesting composer. She, of course, collaborated with Johan Johansson That's right. on many scores, mm-hmm. and now she is writing some of the most interesting music out there. So, And the cool uh, Sicario 2 score, which is, is rocking. Loved it. Um, so we're going to take a quick break, stick around. Much more to come on Score the Podcast with our interview with Hildur Gudnadotter. Very nice. Thank you. We'll be right back. Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. What about strange lands and an escape from the everyday? It's brilliant, George. Before anyone knew them by name. Who's a good boy, Indiana? 400 grand? Let me explain. George, that's our money. Blockbuster. Everybody, take cover! Following the spectacular failures. Sir, sir are you all right? And the unexpected triumphs. Can you believe it? I told you, George. I told you. A six-part immersive audio series. Blockbuster. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other platforms. Hey, this is Bear McCreary. You're listening to Score the Podcast. Now back to the show. Hey, it's Robert Kraft, and we are so lucky to be in the studio today with the fabulous Hildur Goodnadotter. Oh, was I close, Hilder? Very, very good. Very and good. <laughs> I'm here with Kenny Holmes. <laughs> you just ready. earned your own <laughs> round of applause right there. Well, I just, you know, I, I, I stumbled forward, but I, I went for it. And I think before we're done today, we need, in fact, why don't you say your name? How would someone standing next to you who you grew up with say your name? They'd say Hildur Guðnadóttir. Now you can't beat that. You can't beat That's that. That's great. I'll never get there. Is this this must be a thing for you like with every interview, I imagine. Yes, yes. And it's you're a, just it's used a great to it. icebreaker actually because It's a great it's Icelandic a great, icebreaker. Yes. Oh. That's nice. Wait, exactly. That's so yeah. nice. Mhm. Very very nice. And um I was mentioning and I think it's worth a shout out that one of the ways I learned sort of to say it is from that movie which we talked about which is The Player where uh, the character is 
named Gutman's daughter. Mm -hmm. And then you told me that Bjork, that's her last name. So we're going to probably have a lot of Icelandic references today. But I found out, I mean, I don't know the the middle part of the story. You now live in Berlin. Mm -hmm. But was there a moment that you decided to leave Iceland for Berlin? And that's where the story begins. The composing started in Iceland, yes? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the music just started when I was born, I guess. I don't really remember not playing music. So I love that. That's a true musician, and yeah. it's something that I want people to understand, that musicians don't just sort of decide at one point in their no, life. No, exactly, exactly. Is yeah. your family musical? Is that how it started? or what? Oh, yeah, yeah, everyone. Everyone is a musician. So it's, it's yeah, it, it, um, it would have been weird if I wouldn't have played music. I think it's either. So you, when you were, was the cello your first choice? Yes, it was. It was, and Did yeah. you play a little three-quarter cello? I did, yes. And yeah. sit on a little stool? Yes. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> so there must be a minute where you went from being a player to I'm going to think about, first of all, just being a writer. Did you start to write music before film music? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I never really... Uh, um, well, I guess to begin with, I don't really distinguish the two. I just see myself as a musician. Perfect. I mean, like I, I do music. Love that. You know, and and um, and it's funny because because um, I realized that when I was in customs um, the last time I I came into the um, into the states, and of course I have a visa as a film composer, and it says Warner Brothers on my visa, and they say, "What do you do?" And I was like, "I'm a musician." I was like, oh, well, I guess I'm actually a composer. I guess that's <laughs> what my <laughs> yes. visa says. But, like, you know, my instinct is just, you know, I, I do music. And and, um, and that's what I have always lived and breathed. And, and um, I never really had any ambitions to, you know, to enter the film world specifically. But um, I've always just, I've loved storytelling from, from us, you know, from it's, always absolutely. and yeah exactly and and it seems like you know loving music and storytelling you know film is just like it's a, it's a really great place to be because you can combine the two yes but um yeah like i said i don't really see myself as a you know film composer or how did you first get specific. what was your first connection to a film was it a indie thing did you did someone ask you to play on something yeah well i started working i started working in theater so um, I guess like my my whole story was just, you know, the cello and then I started doing like pop music and then I started like uh, experimental music and, and, you know, composing was just like always a part of that. So I always just kind of tried to do everything at the at the same time. And I've, I've never really wanted to be pinned down in one box or in mm. one hole because I just I. I, I feel a bit claustrophobic if I'm only supposed to be like one thing, and um, so it's still today. It's it's like you know when when people you know say that I'm you know I'm I'm a film composer or I'm I'm a cellist or like whatever. I just I, I think it's a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> actually, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. It's hard in Hollywood for people not to identify you with one thing and then yes. it's very hard to get out of that yeah exactly exactly but you know I'm, it's it's i guess that's what i'm doing mostly today so yeah. so i guess that's understandable but um but uh yeah so the first films i started to do um yeah i guess they were i guess they were indie indie films and documentaries and, and in iceland in germany yeah the first feature i did was an american feature though that was maybe in i forget what year it was maybe 2000 and no sorry the first feature i did was actually german that was Mm. in 2003 and um yeah so that's the the year that i moved to to berlin actually which is yeah 16 years ago and did you scoring that film feel anything like ooh, this really is something i can be very this the speaks story, to me. Right. The storytelling mm. and the music. Had you thought of that before? Because you just nailed the most important part of being a film composer, which mm. I've had a lot of conversations. It's not being particularly musical, though that helps. Mm-hmm. It's not being political. That really helps. But being a storyteller with music is essential. 
Yeah. And a lot of people don't get that. Yeah. No, I think that's, the, for me, that's the essence. And that's what, that's really the only thing that makes it interesting to me. Like, I, I don't really, like, I'm not really a part, I don't really like the whole politics of, of the business, you know, I'm not oh, really like... Oh, it's funny, I just love that. <laughs> I don't know why anybody would like having 14 opinions on every single thing you do. I, I, I cherish those moments. Yeah, yeah, right, right. No, I, I, I try to kind of, I, I lock myself in my Berlin studio quite, um, you know, most of the time, so I don't really see a lot of people and I don't go out to network or meet and greet or anything like that. So I, I don't really, I don't really even know the industry side of it too much, but... But the the side of it that's that's just like sitting with sitting with a character and just like imagining like what what does that character sound like? What does this situation sound like? And how does that how does that feel? Like that's to me like that's everything. And that's what really what makes it fun and interesting and, and you know, why why I do it. I mean I think that's the the question is what do you do in that situation? And of course, composers do lots of different things. I've heard the story of a composer freaking out because he can't figure out what the character sounds like. And uh, I know one composer who said, I invited the director over at 1130 at night when I was about to quit the film to say, I'm about to quit, but tell me a little bit about who you think this character is. And the director lay down on a couch in a studio and started to talk. Yeah. And while he talked... The composer played the piano and they came up with it. When you're looking at a film, do you have a keyboard in front of you? Do you have a cello? Do you just hum? Do you take a walk around the block or all of the above? Pen and paper, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm not much of a keyboard person. I okay. think um, um, keyboards are to me like I I'm yeah, I've just I never really played the piano. I mean I do play it a little bit, but I've I find um keys a little bit um well i guess it's because it's not my voice really so so i mm. i find keys a little bit um you know they put me put me in a box yes. because because for me um being both a vocalist and a and a cellist um the way that i um sense both pitch and time is very fluid Correct. you know so so keys to me are a little bit Rigid. boxy yeah <laughs> It's so, well tempered. Yes, exactly. And I'm definitely not well tempered. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ill tempered, as it yes, turns out. Exactly. And bare, you just described Robert. And yes. badly behaved. Yes. But exactly. well tempered is an issue because you only yeah. have those. It's People always say, you know, there are only 12 notes. But if you think about different cultures yeah. and scales and Absolutely. the fluidity of playing yeah. between notes exactly. on a stringed instrument. Exactly. Exactly. And between the notes and between the tempos, for me, like that's. To my soul, like that's where the music is for me. So, so if I have like you know, if if uh, if I need to be like forced to be on a click track and keys, I just you know I I don't speak. Like it doesn't it doesn't come out right, and mm -hmm. it doesn't come out as me if I whenever I try to do that. So I'm more of a um, yeah I I because the the voice is one of my main instruments as well then. That's a good access into that, into oh, my music. Fabulous. Yeah, yeah. So I, I sing a lot of the Would music. Would you have an iPhone next to you looking at picture and sing into it? That kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Will, will yeah. you try and find a melody or yeah. a vibe? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I, I, you know, I'll go out for a walk. And I mean, I'll often, like, especially like nowadays, I come in quite early into the process. So I'll be writing the music, you know, to the script more than wow. to the picture. And which is just such wow, a. That's it's interesting. Such, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's been the case. Um, for most of the projects that I've done recently, like Chernobyl and, and uh, The Joker, I came into the process like really early. And that to me is, um, it's just, I mean, it's a luxury to be able to come in. I mean, it's a lot more work, <laughs> you know, in, in some ways. But it's such a luxury because then you can, you're really a part of the whole process of making, you know, a piece of you're experience. You're a filmmaker then. Yes, exactly. How, are you often surprised or shocked at like what your vision was of something in your head and then when you start seeing dailies and and what this what it's actually looking like does that change everything or do you find that you're usually kind of on point by reading just the script well at least recently i've i've um well, maybe it's just being lucky, or or maybe it's just also because you've nailed it's, it. It sounds like <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess like my 
what I what I sense from the characters has also helped form the characters in, in some ways. So, um, you know, that really helps with because I mean, music is such a big part of a film. Thank and, you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I'd like to. I'd like to make a T-shirt <laughs> that says "Music is such a big part yeah. of a film" because not everyone understands that. Go no, on the roof right now and scream yeah. that. Please while continue. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. No, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it can really. I mean, it's it's it's. Um, it can really dominate what people experience from from and when they when, it. yes, the, completely, completely. So I think if you're if you're a part of forming what the characters are before they're formed like you know the 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 feeling of the character and the the emotions of the character and they're kind of they're um i mean i i almost see it like as um as i mean the audience listening to this podcast doesn't see me talk but i i move a lot like you know movement is very important she's moving right now <laughs> <laughs> exactly. i'm gonna narrate hands are moving right. exactly. left hand wow. right hand yeah. left. she's dancing in the studio that's wonderful <laughs> she dances and sings yeah. that's it but it's it's mm-hmm. almost like it's almost like the the music can 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 um set the tone for the choreography of of the of the of the characters. But are yeah. you suggesting that the director of the film would hear some music prior to or while they're shooting and yes. that would influence them? That is yeah. really unique. Yeah. That's yeah. a very unique situation. The only other time I know it is Nino Rota, mm. who wrote Fellini's scores, mm. would record music before Fellini shot and mm-hmm. give him music, yeah. and it would inform the way that Fellini thought of some yeah. of the moments in the film. Yeah, but that's that, what we've been doing now. Because I'm music not. so subtly informs kind of yeah. the understanding of the character. Exactly, and I think like it, it, it just like it really, it really can inform the movement of the characters. You know, the, their emotional movement and their physical movement. You know, the the way that the you know, like the, the tempo and the and the feel of the the feel of the the musical landscape. It just can really inform the how the character. It's moves, such a deep you know. idea of music in film, which is the physicality. Absolutely, that relates yes. the music to the character, and rarely mm-hmm. does anyone. Rarely does a composer even get the chance to be involved in that because it's all been shot, exactly. it's all on camera, yeah. and then you just paste music on yeah. that you hope kind of fits yeah. Yeah. as opposed to being early. Were you early yeah. on Chernobyl? Yes, yeah. I mean, I hadn't... I um, So that process was was quite different from this, but I was... I basically... I worked the music um, alongside the shooting, so I basically... Um, uh, the, the, they filmed most of the um, the series in Lithuania in a power plant that's being mm. decommissioned. Mm, wow. So right before they went there to shoot, I went there to record. So I went there with um, my score producer and Chris Watson, who who records all of the David Attenborough um, uh, films and, and uh, episodes. And so he's like he's like a master field recording engineer, and and it's just like. It's just uh, it's such an experience to listen with him. So we went in there in full, you know, full suit, hazmat suits, <laughs> hazmat suits wow. and, and, and everything. And um, is that why you're glowing a little yes, bit? Yes, right? that, <laughs> that, that, kind of that would be the fluorescent reason. <laughs> glow around you. I wondered. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, so we went there to record the power plant, and um, and we worked the score from those recordings so every single sound in the score is made from those uh power plant recordings and, so, and describe so what you mean by that when you say you were were you banging on stuff and in <clears throat> certain echoes or are you playing instruments inside the power plant no i was i was observing the power plant so i didn't really want to i didn't really want to play it as such but i just wanted to go there and i wanted to um, I wanted to experience what it feels like to be inside a power plant because it's this, it's the uh, the same situation again. It's like how I mean Chernobyl. It's it's like one of the biggest catastrophes of our lifetimes, mm-hmm. you know, and it's and and beyond our lifetimes because the the um, the effects of it are gonna you know be there long long after we're gone. And and it's you know it's such a complicated story to to tell. And you know how does that sound like? How does a catastrophe really feel like and how does it sound and how does it feel to be in that situation and and of course this is this is a scenario that's completely alien to me 
And um, so just going there and, you know, wearing the clothes that these people wear and, you know, just smelling all the all the smells and this like long corridors that just go on for like, kilometers of corridors and just like the, you know, the all the women constantly cleaning the whole power plant. It's just like there's so many there's so many little nuances of, of experiencing going there, which which was just so interesting to observe. Just kind of and building then, the character of the power plant. Yes, exactly. And and how does that sound like? You know, so I just wanted to go there and observe what a power plant really is, because of course we, you know, we um, we associate certain sounds with with nuclear disaster. You know, the um, mm. and the dosimeters and and you know that's kind of the sound of of yeah. nuclear. But right. but there's so many other um sounds that are there that were just so interesting to observe. So I didn't really I didn't play much. I was mostly there um observing and recording recording like hours and hours and, and hours of material. Was and this then, your idea? Yeah. Yeah. Is this what you do to on any project or is this something new that you wanted to try? Well it was uh um so me and, and Sam Slater who produced the score with me, um we were just like, you know, talking back and forth like what we wanted to do with it like how we felt that it sounded like and and um yeah so this was i mean i don't do this for every score obviously like you know for otherwise i'd be you know following killers around on sicario you have to set on some sicario some did you actually <laughs> join a cartel <laughs> exactly it was it can be you know complicated so you're do like i'm just every. i'm just shadowing guys yeah, exactly, your thing. Yeah, i'm so selling many. cocaine professionally yeah. exactly to learn how, to, how it sounds how it sounds <laughs> right i'm shooting can people. you shake that bag yeah right. exactly exactly but it was it was such an interesting process because it's um you know, making music is, um, and also just like, you know, trying to, to, you know, reading scripts and, and, you know, trying to, trying to f make music out of a story. It's uh, so much of it. And most of it is about listening and to go into an environment purely to listen. And with, you know, like Chris Watson is just like, he is, he has the most profound listening presence you know so his presence was so i mean he's a type of person who can you know he can record ants or you know, glaciers or like whatever alive mm -hmm. or or mm -hmm. dead sound he can just he can record it you know so it was just such a profound experience to go there with him and then to go through those recordings again with with that um with with that uh feeling you know of of just being completely present for every single sound and listening to every single sound it was it was a little bit like gold digging you know so yeah. so so the kind of the big um the big solo uh, musician of the score was this door which just made these incredible sounds you know it was it was a door to a pump room that i mean we weren't like closing it and and you know <laughs> moving it at all but we were just like we just came up to this door with a microphone and then we're just like <gasps> oh my god there was like, all these high frequencies that were just making these like crazy, crazy noises. And then, you know, the almost inaudible, but like so high pitched that you just, you really had to like, you know, really had to focus to, to hear anything. Wow. So I would, I would just like I'd listen to this door for hours and hours and hours. And then I'd be like, okay. in minute like 35 and 20 seconds, there's this like, Dee -dee -dee, you know, that, that <laughs> just like, I was like, oh my God, there's a melody. And, you know, so I just like, I take those little snippets and, and they would become the, the melodic aspects of the That's of the score. so cool. So the, of course, Chernobyl is out now on HBO. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get involved with the project in general? What was the connection there? Um, uh, we, how, do, yeah, how did that happen? I th they just asked me to, if I was <laughs> there. You have it. It. That's good. <laughs> they called I and would, asked. Yeah, exactly. She was just wandering around <laughs> Lithuania. And <laughs> yeah. I think the most incredible thing That's about very cool. what, what you're yeah. saying, which as a musician, I'm, it makes so much sense and is so rare, is that you're talking about the experiential aspect mm -hmm. of creating music. Yeah. It's not just cerebral. No. You know, most composers sit down, they look at picture on a two-dimensional frame in front of them mm -hmm. on a monitor and you write music that you think would fit. Mm -hmm. You're talking about actually being in the environment yes. where the story's taking yes. place. You're yes. physically feeling yeah. it. Yeah. Um, listening. I mean, I don't think I've ever, any director would be so lucky to have you 
say, this would help me with your movie to truly experience it and then interpret. Mm. You know, you're the translator. Mm -hmm. You're going to take that environment. And you're going to create movie music. Mm -hmm. Well, look what it did for Ludwig Gornson going to Africa and taking all that in and creating a score out of like the actual surroundings as opposed yeah. to just jumping on your computer. Like that's probably a really effective way to to yeah. really capture it. Yeah. 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 I mean, for me, it's just it's it it is. You know, music is such a physical. It's such a physical experience, and and. Um, I think it's just so important to to physically experience, um, yeah, physically experience sounds and, and smells and, and environments and, and like to really be able to go into the essence of, of you know the story being told. I think and and I think like with with feature films, of course, that's you know it's it's a bit different because it's not so tangible. It's not like a place or like a you know mm. historical event that happened. You know, so it's a bit. It's a bit of a different approach, but I, um, I definitely when when I'm reading, I, um, I, I do feel like I um, enter. You know, it's it's like I'm 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 a bit silly when I'm reading. Like I normally like you know have the, the facial expressions of what's happening in the, <laughs> in the Just story. Really visualizing, yeah. you're living it. <laughs> yes, exactly. So that. Um, um, yeah, I'm probably not allowed to say very much about the Joker, of course, but but that like I can probably say this. That's, that's that's probably okay. But like reading a script is just like what is he like experiencing, and what is that like? How can I? And of course, like I don't have picture. I just like I have to go by my instincts, and and I have to go by what I imagine that you know this feels like, and 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 that is really physical for me. I think we can we can come back to the joker after we take a little break yeah. i i've been listening to your score for sicario 2 particularly mm -hmm. and it's really unique it's really unique um palette that you've chosen mm. i mean it's and it makes me wonder here you start as a cellist and this is somewhere between electronic and primal and extremely contemporary. And I think... It rocks, too. That is a testament <laughs> to something that we have to be... You know, everyone's on eggshells about, but I think we can be very clear about the fact that one of the things that I always experienced as a head of music was pictures would come up and a woman would be put forward as a composer. And... A lot of men who were making the movie would say, yeah, but this one's got a rock. And I'd say, um, let me get this straight. So women only do delicate music? I mean, I, I know a lot of really <laughs> rock. You know, how many bands and singers and musicians do you need to know? Has anybody ever seen Aretha Franklin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, oh, well, she's yeah. a woman. She's, yeah. So you hear Sicario that particular score and you think this is so can i say badass yes yes <laughs> so um have you ever run into anybody thinking that a woman can't do something this hard-edged and this electronic and this kind of it's not delicate and it's not somehow pinned to a gender conception do you find that still oh god yeah every day <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> no, it's a uh, I mean, I'm I'm just so used to it, so so I I hardly notice it anymore. But um, I'm as you can probably gather from speaking to me, I'm I'm a relatively you know I I laugh a lot, and I'm you know I'm a rather kind of open and joyous person. But I I guess I just need like an outlet for the darkness in me, so that wants to come out seemingly in in, in music and and um, uh, yeah, Johan, who whom. Of course, I worked with for like over a decade. Always used to joke about like, oh God, Hilda, you're always the most brutal of. <laughs> <Like, laughs> I love when, that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so whenever like you know, whenever something like really dark needed to be brought to the table, then you know, I'm I'm normally called in. And uh, the queen of dark. So yeah. basically, if we're <laughs> Together somewhere, I shouldn't turn my back on you at any point because the <laughs> yeah, you think that's a yoga mat, but <laughs> be, you know. we're going to wrap you in. I would like to say that Hilda did bring her yoga mat 
yes. to this interview, which I really appreciate because I missed yoga this morning. Oh, right. Yeah. And because That's I what I was asking if you wanted to work anything out. I was going to do right. a little kind yeah. of mountain pose yeah, or a yeah, little yeah. downward facing dog, but yeah. we can talk about it, which is almost like experiencing it, but different. I love the fact that you're saying the dark side can come out in that way and yeah. who doesn't have a dark side i mean everyone yes. everyone is and we have like everyone has all the sides and, yes and um i think it's important that all the sides have you know have have their outlets and um and I get rid of all my darkness and through my music. Thank so God. So, <laughs> so well, I, I, I look good. forward to talking about the Joker then. <laughs> that's right. Because it's think, pretty dark. I think we take a little break for mm -hmm. a minute to catch our breath and we come back and we talk about the Joker. Love it. Okay. More with Hilder when we return. Hey, SCORE fans, it's Kenny. Now that Season 2 is going strong, you can look good while you're listening. We just released the official SCORE the Podcast t-shirt. There's multiple colors and sizes for men, women, and children. And they're super soft. I just got a few myself. They fit really nice, and they feel great, and they look cool. Uh, so go to score-movie.com slash store. Check those out, and you can also get a copy of SCORE, a film music documentary on Blu-ray, and our uh, interview bonus disc that has the extended interviews from the film. So plenty to check out, score-movie.com slash store, and get your shirt today. Hey, we're back with the fabulously named Hilder Goodnight, daughter. Yes. Okay, good. And um, the fabulous, because she is fabulous and writing unbelievable music and really... A big year. A Chernobyl and, uh, of course, the Joker coming up in Joker. October. Yeah. Yeah. Fourth of October. That's when it releases. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. 10-4. Mm -hmm. By the way, I hope all of you are getting on microphone the way that Hilder says yes which is very Scandinavian and Icelandic and it's something I've always loved, which is instead of saying, yeah, the way an American would, it's... All lazy. It's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which yeah. always, I kind of think, yeah. is there something surprising? Um, but the Joker, actually, we were talking before the break about joyful and darkness. And the Joker is kind of an amazing combination of... A uh, character with a big painted smile mm -hmm. who, last time I checked, has a lot of darkness. Yes, and, exactly. I mean, the trailer is seeable. I'm not mm -hmm. sure whose music is in the trailer. but Not mine, yeah, but that's, that's it's always comes the case. Comes to the job. <laughs> but it, Pretty standard. <laughs> yeah. There is a lot in that trailer that sort of suggests this is going to be menacing. Yeah. and um, it's, a, it's a deep dive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what you were talking about getting inside a character, it's either joyful or terrifying, I would think, as a composer to try and figure out who Joaquin Phoenix is, one of our greatest, most complicated, mm -hmm. most expressive actors, certainly one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Do you sit with picture of Joaquin and try and think about it? Have you gotten to that? Is there a picture yet for you to look at? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah there's been a picture for, for quite a while. But um, I think, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's safe to, like, like I said before, because um, I wrote quite a lot of the music before they started shooting, so the music influenced the um, the the performance quite a bit. And, oh wow! Uh, yeah. So, so the Joaquin performers heard? listen. Yeah. 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 Am, am I allowed Jack to say this? Yeah. I, I guess I'm allowed to say this. No. I'm looking up. <laughs> She's looking at, at we have two exactly. FBI agents and two representatives of the studio standing behind us, and they have really big guns. So you're allowed to say it, but um, we're going to be taking you out of here in a body bag. So feel free to say anything, and we have to edit everything. Um, I, I, I think it's probably, I'm, I'm not giving away too much about that. I don't think so. There's no spoilers yeah, there. Yeah, yes. no, exactly. But um, so, yes, so, the, the, so I think the the... The music actually did, and you know, have have a lot of a lot it's of. It's remarkable um, that they're yeah. open to it. Yes. some people are not. No, exactly, and I think it was, it's such a it's such a beautiful process, and 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 um, and I much prefer working in this way than than just getting image like afterwards because um, 
Yeah, then then your instincts about you know the character can also just inform them. You know, it's more of a dialogue. You know, what, what I, do we think? Does the it evolve is? for you? In other words, do you see them, talk to them, play the music? They have notes, and you think, ah, that's a nuance that maybe I should add or subtract. Yes, of course. I mean, there, there's a lot of the music is is you know made also afterward. You know, there's a whole bunch of music that comes afterwards as well. But it's more of, um, I think, this way of working is is just it's more of a dialogue. And you it's know? very immersive in a yes. way. Do yeah. you, when you present your music, some people often construct whole suites like an overture mm-hmm. and play it for the director and say which themes here and here themes, or do you put just snippets of music for them to hear? What does a process look like where you bring music? Is it one piece? Mm, no, several pieces, but so, so I think it's more of the, um, it was more a case of like, this is what I experienced from these characters. Like it wasn't to certain scenes or anything like oh. that. It was, it was more just like the, um, this is how I experienced the character moving and, you know, this kind of tempo and, and this, you know, this kind of, um, sort of, um, sense of melody and like this is this is where i see him like this is what 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 this character sounds like to me and this is how he moves you know through the music to me and and uh, and we just were in a like perfect agreement to that i think it oh. was just like it was quite wonderful have you had a chance to meet with joaquin yes yeah i and, went to the and studio. talk about just his his role in this and i mean you guys are kind of co-creating this character with the music and his acting mm-hmm. um what what was what were those conversations like well we didn't um maybe luckily because I'm, I'm not really like a words person i'm more a music person so we we didn't like discuss it at all you know neither is he to, yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly. he's a very quiet guy yes exactly exactly so i mean i did meet him at the uh, because i went to the the shooting so i i did Meet him there, but we didn't. You know, he's uh, he's a you know uh, an actor that that is very much in character, like yes. when he's shooting. So it's not really a time for any discussion. The and, Joker and didn't want to talk about his own theme, <laughs> is what you're saying? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And I think also the, the I mean, what's so magical about music is that you know normally you don't. There's not a whole lot to discuss, really. It's it's just like you know the the feeling of the music should tell you everything and you shouldn't really um or that, that that's my opinion at least like you shouldn't need to um talk about what the music should be doing you should just be able to feel it automatically i think that's from my next t-shirt music there's not a whole he has lot so of many t-shirts. <laughs> it is so true yeah. Yeah. people come and in it's and so struggle hard. to say yeah. i mean I, I probably said it a thousand times you know hey that that cue needs to be a little more yellow, they yeah. say, you know, yeah. or, and it'd be, I know, because directors particularly, and directors always get nervous. They say, you know, I don't know anything about music. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. I, I would always say, you don't have to. No, exactly. Tell me how you feel. About exactly, this. Yeah. exactly. Well, it's too exactly. sad. Yeah. Well, is, is it a particular kind of sad? Is it melancholy? Is it bittersweet? Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. it's. It's tragic and I hate it. Okay, that's all yeah. I needed to hear. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's, that's a lot of information. It's pretty clear. <laughs> I got both those. Yeah. Um, and so I think we're always curious and our audience always wants to know because there's so many perspiring young composers who are looking to you for guidance and, <laughs> and your career. Mm-hmm. How did they find you on The Joker? Do you know if the director heard something that you'd written? Um, yes. And, yeah. But how did you, and what was that first call like? Um, well, it was very pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it's yeah. so nice. No, again, I, th- I think... Um, you might, you sound like the easiest person to work with in Hollywood. Right. Ever. And <laughs> you, will actually, yeah. you will get into a hazmat suit for your gig. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> no, but I think... Um, I I think it was the music editor who is absolutely magical who was working on this film. He's just he's such such a magnificent um, person to work with. Mm. I think it was probably him that introduced uh, Todd Phillips to my music. Mm-hmm. And um, anything in particular did they mention that they heard? I think they were just listening to my records. 
I think. And mm-hmm. um, so, yes, yeah, my agent says thumbs up. So I, I think I, I'm probably <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. I think I'm probably right in saying it. So, and then, yeah, again, they contacted me and, and um, you know, asked me if I was interested. And, you know, we had a really good You didn't really say, don't bother me and never call yeah. me at this number again? <laughs> are you interested in scoring the Joker? <laughs> you know what? You guys are just annoying with yeah, these. Yeah. You said yes. And these robocalls. Right. Yeah, so annoying. Yeah. No, I mean, of course, the, obviously, you know, it's, it's that type of film that, I'm I'm sure like a lot of names came up and you know this I was probably not the only person that they were um talking to but um and then I did some demos and 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 oh, great. Uh, yeah and that I think you know a lot of those demos really inform the music of the of the Do you know if they the tempt film? any of your music into the picture not original but from other films that you did Uh there's a been a tiny bit of that but um, it mostly it's been just original music that we've managed that is to amazing yeah. so yeah. they don't have temp load no and fall in love with something by jerry goldsmith and no, then you exactly. have to rewrite no, it exactly and i think and i think that's what i love so much about this process is that it's oh it's its own thing you know so so the 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 sound can be really true to itself like the the music can be really true to itself and it's not trying to imitate anyone else it just is well, we what, were, what, what it is we were talking earlier before we started recording about how this movie is like a it's a superhero movie quote unquote because it's a comic book but this is a more deep dive into a character development as opposed to like someone flying around with a cape mm-hmm. um did, when you came on board and started working with todd phillips who's known as a a comedy director mm-hmm. was, uh, I mean, is that a, a, an interesting approach? Cause he's, he's known for some of the funniest movies mm-hmm. and this is the when hangover. you watch the, when you watch the trailer, this is mm-hmm. not, it does not look funny. <laughs> it looks terrifying mm-hmm. and, and creepy and sort of personal. And, mm-hmm. um, what, what's been your experience working with, uh, Todd Phillips? It's been great. It's been really, really great. And I think he, um, he has he's shown me a lot of trust and he's given me mm. a lot of space and he is just he's been very open to um to everything that i that i sent him and and um it's just it's been really really wonderful because um you know that's not always the the case that's so rare and yeah it, it really is, is. is he it musical really yeah i th- i think he is yeah yeah um, I think trust and space yeah. are the two words you would always hope. That might yeah. be a T-shirt. Trust yeah, and space. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, I th- your closet's of, yeah. too cool, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm building them. They're all coming out of this interview. Yeah. No, I think, I think in order to, in order to really create, you know, to, to create something that that is of any, well, I mean, hopefully of any value. I'm. You need. You need space to 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 be able to do that. Like the dialogue has to be open and it needs to be spacious in order for you to be in your creative element. You know, and I think I think that um, Todd has just been really wonderful in allowing me that space, and he's been very open to to um, yeah what what I have to offer. I think that's also an example of a great director. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. you hire people around you as a director that you hope are incredibly capable, talented, have a point of view that might not be yours, you, mm-hmm. certainly with an actor. Mm-hmm. You don't say, here's how you should act. Hey, I've hired you to be the actor and interpret this. Same with a composer. You hope that a composer will come up with original ideas mm-hmm. and your voice mm-hmm. expressing that story. So... That's wonderful. I'd like to ask a little bit about your artist career, Mm -hmm. which I don't know, and I'm not sure if our listeners know, are you making artist records alongside of your film scoring career, and are you continuing to pursue that? Does that start to fade as your film career gets busier? Um, Well, like I said... um when we first started talking here today is that it's really important for me to um to not put myself in a box that i you know that i cl- close close myself off you know so i think for me it um it is really important not to do just films and um but the last few years they've 
taken up most of my space and time, which yeah. has been wonderful. And um, I've really enjoyed that. But I think after, um, also like you said, I mean, it's, it's been a really busy year and, and <laughs> quite hectic. So I, I think after this, I'm going to take a bit of a breather to, to focus on my, my own work. And then we'll we'll see what is it. What a, are you in a band? Are you a solo artist? What what can the listeners expect if they look up your uh, your artist career? Right. Yeah. Well, I've been playing in bands since I was. I think I released my uh, released my first band record when I was around thirteen. So I've always played in nice. bands. And and I um and I'm playing in a um playing with a band these days, which is um I guess you'd call them like a doom metal band. So they're, right called, they're called Sun O, and, and we just released that. The darkness. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and we perform in like full on, you know, full cape and, and you know, Has fog. Been. And yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Right. What's, that, what's that band, Guar? Kind of like that. Do you know what well, I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But that that's like wonderful music to perform. It's it's uh, it's so loud that it's performing or like you know just being in the audience is like having a full body massage. Like every, <laughs> I remember after one concert, like everything I touched was fluffy because all my nerves had just been like massaged with, <laughs> with sound. So I'm hoping to. You're like a superhero. <laughs> like you're sitting here and you're like so quiet and nice and you're like oh the call was it was really nice and then you go on stage and you're like in a death metal band yeah, yeah i love it yeah I absolutely yeah, love it yeah yeah it's 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 fun it's a you know it's i was many different picturing sides. a kind of ethereal cool instrumental solo album is that yeah i mean I, 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 I play with a band as well which is more like um you like an indie band. I mean, I haven't been playing with them so much because I, I hijacked um, one of the band's core members to, to work for me on the <laughs> they're with me on the, on the film stuff. Yeah. So um, we haven't been playing a lot with um, with that band. But I mean, I'm, I'm mostly um, I think I'm mostly known for my solo records, and um, that's what I was doing mostly before um, before I started the the film work, and which is also like you know. I think where where most of the um, directors that I've worked with they know me from from my That's solo fantastic. work. Fantastic! Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Are you yeah. on a label, or do you look for a label for your next one? Uh, yeah, I am. I've been on a label called Touch, which is um, an English um, experimental label, or like a really, um, really beautiful label that I've that I've been on for hmm. for uh, since two thousand seven. So, um, but I'm. Um, I'm releasing now with with Deutsche Grammophon. Nice. So they're going to be releasing the Chernobyl soundtrack, and then I'll be doing some some more work with them. That is so a cool. lot to look forward to. Yeah. yeah. Um, we wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, your friendship and collaboration with Johan Johansson. Obviously, that was a big big blow to the film music world and to mm. the the community. Um, what? How did you guys meet, and what was what was your relationship like uh, working together? Well, we um, are obviously both Icelandic, so um, Iceland is really small. So um, mm -hmm. most people in Iceland, you know, the, the music industry or the music circle, let's call it, in, it's not yes. really an industry, it's that <laughs> the music circle is, is tiny. And um, so most people, you don't really even remember like when or how you met, but, mm. but um, I think we we got to know each other like in the late 90s first and we're just like you know we're friends that were you know with <clears throat> being involved in the same you know the same circle of musicians sure. that were you know yeah. we, we'd do concerts and events and stuff like that and then we started uh playing together and yeah i think it must have also been like 2003 which um, we did a piece together for a dance performance mm -hmm. And that was kind of, it was, it really set the tone for our musical, well, you could really call it marriage because we, yeah. we did pretty much every single project together since that, since that very first um, piece. And, um, and up until the, the day he, he passed away, we worked together on, on every, everything, basically. It's incredible. Mm. And, um. It's interesting also because I know that you were equal partners mm -hmm. on so much of the music. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to find out that 
It took a while for you to be acknowledged mm. for your role in that, and not surprising in that the man often gets yeah. the credit. Yeah, and yeah. oh, by the way, uh, you know, yeah. there was someone else in the room yeah, for a lot yeah, of it. Yeah. And so yeah. um, certainly he was hugely talented. And I think that for that small circle in Iceland, the quality and quantity of music that comes out, uh, there must be something in the ice. Mm. Because... Oh, my goodness. I, I did... Uh, <laughs> do you know, I did a picture with Yonzi. Oh, right. Yeah, and yeah, we yeah. did We Bought a Zoo. Right. With Cameron right. Crowe, who yeah, wanted... Um, yeah, yeah. said, I want the guy in Sigur Ross to score the movie. And I thought, oh, I love Sigur Ross, yeah. but I don't know if he's ever scored a film. That's one of my favorite scores. Oh, beautiful. And he was just so... It's uh, now interesting to think about... He was very much in experiential in the way he wanted mm. to think about the movie. Yeah. And it wasn't the traditional way of scoring a movie. He wanted to be in a studio experimenting yeah. with picture. Yeah. And, um, and I loved what he wrote. It was yeah. so fresh. It yeah. really was fresh. Now, Jones is my favorite. We're, we're practically family. We, um, his sister is my very best friend. So his family pretty much adopted me. So, so. Oh, that's so wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I think Jonesy He's and wonderful. Alex Summers are touring right now. I yes, think I saw yeah. that. Yeah, I think they're actually in town. They, they moved here. And, um, but they, they are going on tour, yeah. Yeah, yeah I saw yeah. that and I'd like to see it because mm. they were brilliant. Yeah. And actually like one of the coolest things that Jonesy did, and I, I always remember, you know, I'm, Certainly in film scoring right now, you have all this incredible technology. Mm. He wrote and recorded a lot of this score on a very funky Casio. Yeah. It might have been a $99 keyboard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'd run out of batteries. You had to put a battery in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we put a microphone near it, yeah. and it was kind of cheap sounds, and yet it was just the sound of the movie. Yeah. And he found that instrument and said, I think I'm going to record the theme with this and we're going to support it. But it was a little bit of, this is a little nervous making. This is a movie with like uh, Matt Damon and Scarlett <laughs> Johansson and we're recording with a really funky toy <laughs> and it worked. It's like the That's Rugrats beautiful. piano story. Yeah, you're That's right. Beautiful. Similar. It's great. Um, I just wanted to ask you just about your, uh, you know, moving forward and looking ahead into the world of film music. There's a there was a study last year that said 1.4 percent of film composers are women, which mm -hmm. is a staggering number. How proud are you to carry this torch? You have these two big projects, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of you know young film composers, uh, young women film composers looking to you to kind of mm -hmm. lead that charge. How, how does that make you feel, and and what does that mean to you? Well, it means a lot to me to be able to um, set an example. I mean, f both for other composers and also just for the for the industry to 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 just say like you know women can also do this because that's what I kind of ran into quite a bit um, was that uh, th this kind of feeling of like but can she deal with it you know can she handle it and it's just like why wouldn't I be able to handle it <laughs> you know? so I think you know the the, um, the best way to change um the this this kind of um myth you know it's just a sudden example and I, and i think you know if if i can if i can be a part of just setting an example of of like well, hell yes women can you know score films like why wouldn't they and and um so that's that's just like such a privilege and and um and i really hope that 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 helps you know. I think you've nailed it. I think the best way to prove it and mm -hmm. dispel that myth mm -hmm. is to crush it, yeah. which is what you are doing. Yeah, the music yeah. is so exceptional that you're, and I just, I think I speak for everyone, I can't wait to see and hear the Joker. Yeah, I right. really am excited, and I think we're lucky. I don't even do like midnight showings, but... I probably will for that one. Like I've been watching, <laughs> I've been following and the trailers and it just everything from the look of it, the cinematography, the color and now you're talking about the music. Oh, I just 
Yeah, and I think I might wear one of the T-shirts. I'm going to have to listen <laughs> to all the what? T-shirts that I that I create. Because the, the funny thing is, you never wear T-shirts. I know. I, well, it, you, you have know, button-up shirts. You have all these T-shirts you've never worn that say all these. Things. I think I'm going to start a new business, which is those hidden messages it, under the right, shirts. It's right. And the you have no idea. The T-shirt undershirt. They're called Hilder says. That's going to be the whole. That's going to be my whole new line. But I know you're actually making a plane across the ocean, mm-hmm. and we're going to get traffic in Los Angeles is really cool and easy and there's no pressure ever yeah, yeah, yeah. and everything always goes I mean we like to think smoothly. you flew here just for this interview oh, yes, of course I did of and course. squeezed in a couple other meetings around it but I it's a privilege to be Thank here with you, you and to be able to talk to you about these movies we're here with Hilder who wants to take you want to take your shot say your name Hilder Guanadoter. That's close. No, <laughs> what? We're going to say that's the Perfect. kind of Latin American pronunciation. <laughs> that's that they say. I'm, gonna, I'm saying that you've really, I'm tr- you've I, really you made us proud today. Gudna, <laughs> yes, daughter. Beautiful. Is that good? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm so you know I'm I'm so used to I, I'm so used to Andy. <laughs> we got a winner. <laughs> Kenny's. <laughs> yeah. Good. No. Well, it's a privilege to be here with Hilder. And thank you so Hilder, much. thank you so much. Thank Chernobyl on me. HBO. And yep. then, of course, the Joker. You already know it's coming out in October. Uh, be sure to follow us on Twitter at Score the Podcast. Our T-shirts are available on score-movie.com slash store. And uh, rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And please uh, come back next week for our next exciting episode. Thanks so much. Thank you.